In our first two studies of Galatians, we met this group known as the Judaizers, a group of troublesome Jews who had infiltrated the church in Galatia and were teaching that in order to be saved, you still had to follow parts of the Old Testament law, like circumcision. The Apostle Paul, in contrast, was teaching the true gospel, the gospel of grace, and the message that it's only by faith in the substitutionary life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we can be saved. The Judaizers were attacking Paul's credibility by spreading false rumors about him, and in today's study, we're going to hear Paul's testimony, which he will share to encourage believers, but also to refute some of the specific accusations of the Judaizers, namely that Paul's apostleship was not legitimate because they said it was self-appointed. In other words, their claim was Paul was not a legit apostle because he had just appointed himself an apostle. Furthermore, some were saying that Paul had received his gospel message from the real apostles in Jerusalem, then had split away from them and started teaching this false gospel, a circumcision-free gospel, a works-free, grace-based gospel. And Paul's going to share, to counter that, how he heard the gospel, where he got his doctrine, where he first met, when he first met with the apostles in Jerusalem, And he's going to give a timeline of his life and his ministry, all of which will completely destroy these accusations being made against him. So let's jump in. We're in Galatians chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 11. Paul keeps speaking, and he says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 12 is an incredible claim by Paul. He's claiming that the gospel message that he teaches wasn't taught to him by any other man. He didn't overhear somebody else preaching it and say, I'm going to run with that. Paul's claim is that he was taught by the Lord Jesus himself directly and personally. And Paul tells his readers that the gospel he's preaching has not been altered in any way. Therefore, because this gospel is 100% from Jesus himself, Paul can say with total honesty, this is the true gospel message. The idea is, how do you know? Because it came straight from Jesus. Like one-on-one, he gave it to me. So I'm really sure. While it took Paul a few years to figure out the intricacies of his theology, the core gospel message was revealed to Paul on the road to Damascus. His understanding that Jesus is God was instantaneous when Jesus revealed himself to him as God on the road to Damascus. He understood immediately that he was the Messiah, that he lived, died, and rose again in our place, and that salvation was through faith in him alone. So would you write this down? It's your first fill-in. Paul's gospel message came directly from Jesus and was received on the road to Damascus. Paul's gospel message came directly from Jesus and was received on the road to Damascus. Paul answers his accusers by saying, I didn't learn the gospel from the apostles in Jerusalem. It was given to me directly by Jesus, and all I've done is faithfully repeat it. And Paul sneaks in a dig at his accusers, actually, when he says, I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, because all these Judaizers hadn't gained their knowledge of Judaism by reading the Scriptures firsthand. They learned by memorizing the interpretations of Scriptures that were taught by rabbis. And in this system that was in play in Israel at this time, the rabbis' teachings, the rabbis' interpretations had actually become elevated above the Scriptures. Now, no one would have said that, but in practice, that was very much the functional reality of the situation. The things that the rabbis said and taught were considered more important to apply to your life than the Scriptures themselves. The idea was, well, I mean, you could read the Scriptures, but you might not interpret it correctly. The best thing you could do is not read the Scriptures. Instead, read this rabbi's interpretation of the Scriptures, because this guy really has it together. Paul points out that these Judaizers were actually the ones teaching a distorted message. 
They were the ones not going to the scriptures themselves. They were the ones failing to evaluate whether or not what they were teaching was the truth. Paul had grown up with the same type of education as these guys. And after encountering Jesus, Paul looked back on all his rabbinical and Torah studies and he said in Philippians, all that stuff, that whole system, I, I count them as rubbish. I count them as rubbish, all those accolades. And you can read in Philippians 3, his full explanation of why he says that. He says they're worthless. The most important thing is knowing Jesus directly and personally. Now Paul says, and if you want to question my previous devotion to, to Judaism, just remember that I was more devoted than any of you have ever been. Paul's going to bring that up. Oh, you guys think I wasn't devoted? You guys think that you can be saved by following the law? Well, just remember, I've done that, and I did it better than any of you ever have or ever will. So keep that in mind. He says in verse 13, For you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Paul's goal had been to destroy, to wipe out, to eradicate the church of Jesus from existing anywhere. That had been his goal. Verse 14, and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. As Paul shares elsewhere in his writings, he was basically a super Jew. He was all in when it came to being Jewish and rising through the religious and political ranks of Jewish society. He was zealous regarding his Judaism, which led him to persecute the young Christian church viciously. Let me just read you some excerpts from the book of Acts written about Paul's persecution of the Christian church by Dr. Luke. They're on your outline. It says in Acts 8, as for, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. In Acts 9, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. The original language there is, is designed to conjure up the image of a wild boar with flaring nostrils, enraged and just rampaging. It goes on and says, I went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he asked for referral letters to the synagogues in Damascus from the high priest in Jerusalem asking the synagogues in Damascus to assist him in his persecution of the Christians so he could drag them back to Jerusalem to be tried. In Acts 22, Paul says himself, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. You see, one of the reasons we know that Dr. Luke's account in the book of Acts was factual is because he cites all of these references as evidence. And so this writing is published and shared at a time when you could still check out these references. Paul's testimony includes names and places. He actually says, if you don't believe that I was actually once somebody going out there killing and imprisoning the early Christian church, you can go ask the elders in Jerusalem about the letters I had them write for me. You can go ask the high priest in Jerusalem about the assignment I asked. And all of this is evidence that this is not just a story, this is factual history. Paul beat, imprisoned, and even participated in the murder of believers. And what I love about Paul's story is that God used him to prove that there's nobody beyond redemption. There's nobody beyond redemption. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you'll turn to Jesus, you'll find forgiveness, you'll find hope, you'll find a new life. Would you make a note of this? I love this. Nobody is so good that they don't need the grace of God. And nobody is so bad that they're beyond the grace of God. Nobody is so good that they don't need the grace of God. And nobody is so bad that they're beyond the grace of God. God took this vicious persecutor of the Christian church and said, I'm going to use you to go and take the message to the Gentiles the people that you hated the most. I'm going to cause you to commit your life to serving the church, the organization that you hated the most, and I'm going to have you preach the message that is the complete opposite of the way you lived your life previously. Your message is going to be the grace of God. 
Now notice the first word of the next verse, verse 15, but, but. And we'll find that the but is that Jesus stepped into Paul's story. But when it pleased God who separated me, would you underline from my mother's womb and called me through his grace? Would you underline through his grace? You see, God is sovereign over all of time. He knows everything about us. He knows every decision we'll ever make. And he knows it long before we're born. And so before we're born, across time, he looks into our souls and he knows which of us will welcome him, which of us will receive him, and which of us will reject him. And if he knows that we would welcome him under any circumstances, he goes to work in our lives bringing about those circumstances that would bring us to him. He looked at Saul and he said, listen, this is going to take a lot. This guy is going to need a lot of convincing because he's pretty invested in not believing the gospel, in not believing Jesus is the Son of God. So what happens, he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus, is supernaturally struck with temporary blindness in order to have the hardness of his heart broken. Just as the Lord knew that it would take being on the cross next to Jesus to reach the thief who welcomed him into his life. Just as he knew what it would take to reach you. And whatever time you have in your earthly life after you give your life to the Lord, he prepared things for you to do during that time as well. His word says that he prepared good works that you might walk in them. Paul says, I hated Christians. I hated Jesus. But God knew, he knew that if I was shown the truth, if I was given eyes to see, I would receive it. So even while I was in my mother's womb, God had already planned to show me grace by calling me to be his at the right time. And that, that moves me. It should move you, it should humble us, it should overwhelm us with gratitude because it means that none of us, whatever you think your story is, none of us stumbled into Christianity by accident. Do you realize that? None of us stumbled into Christianity by accident. And I think the Lord can't wait for us to get to heaven so that he can reveal to us the full scope of his work in our lives and all the moving pieces, the intricacy of the work that he did to get us to the place and position where he could be revealed to us in a time and a place when we would receive him. I think we're going to be blown away by the magnitude of God's grace. So would you write this down? God's grace was at work in our lives before we were even born. His grace was at work in your life, in my life, long before we were even born. It also blesses me because it fills me with confidence to know that if the Lord began his work in me that far back, before I was even born, with that much planning, I can trust that he's put as much or more thought and planning into getting me across the finish line. I can trust that. And he'll do the same for my kids. He'll do the same for your kids. He'll do the same for that loved one that you know is saved but is struggling to walk it out right now. Listen to me. As Paul said to the Philippian believers, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. He didn't just call us and show us grace from the time we were in our mother's womb and even before that and then say, well, I guess you're on your own now. He didn't put that much work into us to just leave it to chance. He has a plan for the whole process. That's a promise. That's a promise to believe, to stand on, to pray in thanksgiving, to believe, to hold on to, and to confess. And if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that God is going to finish what he started in you, that he's got a plan, just start thanking him for that. Start confessing it until you believe it. I don't care if it takes you a hundred times, a thousand times, a hundred thousand times. Just begin to thank him for that every day until you begin to believe it. And understand that God is working in your life that way right now. Right now. Not just before you began. Not just at the end of your earthly life. But everything he's doing in your life. Everything that he is teaching you. Everything he's developing in you right now is for your next level of ministry. Do you know what that is? 
Do you know what your next level of ministry is? Do you know what God has planned for you next? I do. For every single person in this room who's put their faith in Jesus. I know. I know what your next big assignment is. Your biggest assignment coming up. You and I are going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. A thousand years on the earth when Jesus rules the earth in the millennial kingdom. And so if you don't think or believe that God is grooming you for a position of great ministry importance, then you haven't read your Bible. Because he is right now. So don't be so limited in your thinking and in your faith that you look at your life and you say, "Eh, I mean, let's, let's just be honest. By this point, it's pretty clear I don't have a major significant ministry calling on my life. I'm not gonna go church plant somewhere or be a missionary. That much is obvious by now or too much time has passed. Don't be so limited in your thinking. Remember what the word says, because if that's the way you're thinking, you couldn't be more wrong. God chose you before you were even born. He's working in your life right now to prepare you for the future. Not just the abstract, vague future, but a very specific future in which he has a ministry role planned for you in his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years and assignments that go beyond that in the ages to come. So take your training seriously. Take what the Lord is doing in you now. I don't care if you're young or if you think you're old. See there, I didn't even call you old. I said if you think you're old, because nobody's old, right? Wherever you are in life, don't think that what's going on right now doesn't matter. Don't think that what God is doing in you right now doesn't matter. If you feel that God is trying to work something in you, don't say, Uh, well, you know, I don't really need to grow because, I mean, I'm, I'm more coming to the tail end of things than the beginning of new things. There's eternity in front of you. Eternity in front of you. And so God is gonna be working on you till the day your earthly life ends. Till the day it ends. Because the day your earthly life ends, the truest part of your life will begin. This life is about getting ready for that. So don't think that God isn't working on you for something great right now. He is, he is. Now there's one other point I need to make while we're on this verse. Paul tells us that God called him while he was still in his mother's womb. Not only did God call him, but the text tells us that God had already planned Paul's specific ministry to preach to the Gentiles. Paul had a specific destiny God had a specific plan for his life while he was still in his mother's womb. Similarly, this is what the Lord told the prophet Jeremiah. It's on your outlines. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And the prophet Isaiah said that the Lord was the one who formed me from the womb to be his servant. And the Lord has a plan for everyone that will become one of his children while they are still in their mother's wombs, which is just one of the reasons that those who follow Jesus and love the Lord believe that abortion is wrong. We believe that we are taking the lives of men and women who have been gifted and called by God with purpose and with destiny. And when we step in to abort a child, we say, God, I don't care what your plans are for this child. They don't fit in with my plans. And so I can't help but wonder how many amazing artists, how many brilliant doctors, how many incredible pastors and writers and worship leaders and missionaries, the world has never known because they were rejected before any of us had the chance to know them, before we had a chance to see the destiny and the greatness that God had imbued them with. One day we will see them. One day we will see them because praise God they're with him right now and we'll be with them soon. But without being heavy, I want to be as as clear as I can without doing a whole side message. You can't believe the Bible and believe that abortion is okay. You, You can't do that because God was at work 
in the life of every person before they were even born, before they were even born. We'll keep going in verse 16. And Paul says, it was to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. This is Paul telling us that after he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he didn't go and talk about it with people. He didn't go straight to Jerusalem and meet with the apostles. He felt led by God after his sight was restored in the city of Damascus to go deeper into the region of Arabia, the land of the Nabataeans, where he stayed likely somewhere near Damascus for about three years. And we assume that in those years, Paul was ferociously restudying the Old Testament scriptures, trying to figure out how to reconcile all of these scriptures with the reality of the revelation that he had just received, that Jesus of Nazareth was Messiah, the Son of God. Paul would have known the scriptures inside and out. I'm not exaggerating when I say likely all of them by memory, all of them by memory. But he realized that if he had missed Jesus, then he had been reading the scriptures incorrectly this whole time. And so he had to figure that out. So he studied the scriptures. He meditated on the scriptures. And as he says, the Lord Jesus came and taught him. And the Paul that emerges a couple of decades later in letters like this letter to the Galatians in the New Testament of our Bibles is a Paul who is a theological beast who understands all the places that Jesus shows up in the Old Testament scriptures, how all the prophecies and all the pictures in the Old Testament fit with what Jesus has done and who Jesus is. I think there's a little bit more behind why God called Paul out into the relative wilderness of Arabia. You know, for most of us, seeking the Lord is hard, if we're honest. Waiting on the Lord for more than 30 seconds is hard for most of us. Talking to the Lord is, is hard. That's why there's things that we struggle with that we've shared with other people but haven't even shared with the Lord yet. That's why there are sometimes things that we've asked other people to pray about, but we haven't even prayed about them yet. And I think it would have been in some ways very easy for Paul to just go to Jerusalem and start having theological conversations about all of his questions about the Old Testament instead of seeking the Lord himself. For most of us, we'd take talking to a person about theology over seeking the Lord about theology. And Paul was a passionate guy. He would have easily gotten embroiled in heated debates and the infinite number of conversations he could have had in the academic center of Judaism, which was Jerusalem. But the Lord wanted to speak to Paul directly, so he got Paul away from any real potential Jewish audience. Maybe you're feeling lonely or isolated in the struggle that you're going through. Maybe you feel like there's no one around to talk to. Perhaps that's because the Lord is calling you to speak to Him. Perhaps the Lord is removing all those other options so that the only option is to do the thing that you should have been doing all along, which is seeking and waiting on Him. You know, that, that wilderness place, that place of isolation, is a great place to meet with the Lord free of distractions. Paul was also a classic overachiever, classic go-getter, and it must have driven his natural self crazy to be learning all this incredible information about the Scriptures, getting all this revelation, and, and yet having no one to really share it with. The Lord was teaching Paul about the importance of operating according to his timing. The Lord was teaching Paul that he'd be ready when he said he was ready. The Lord was teaching Paul, hey Paul, I know you used to just be running around like a a chicken with its head cut off trying to do as many good righteous works as you could as possible, but but in a relationship with me, that's not how it works. In a relationship with me, you focus on me and then the good works come naturally. You go and do the things that I lead you to do moment to moment. It was a vital lesson for him to learn. It's one that we need to learn sometimes in the wilderness too, just how to wait on the Lord's timing. Paul also 
had been earning plaudits his whole life. He'd been the star student, the the prodigy of Judaism. He'd been applauded and commended and recognized every step of the way. And God gave him three years away from Jewish culture to be broken of that need that he would have developed for recognition. We know that Paul would have been married and since he takes off for Arabia for three years, I think we can likely assume that his wife left him almost immediately after he shared with her his conversion to Christianity. Paul would have needed time to grieve as well, time to work through all those emotions. And sometimes that wilderness time and place in our lives is so that God can break us and free us from the things that are not good for us, like our need for approval, our need for recognition, our need to be in a relationship, our our need to appear as though we have it all together, our concern about what others think of us. Because when you're in the wilderness, when you're in isolation, nobody cares. Nobody cares. And sometimes that's exactly what we need. It was what Paul needed. And sometimes the only way God can get us ready to receive revelation is by removing all those distractions. Sometimes we say, we say, Lord, I just need a word from you. I'll wait. Okay, that's as long as I've got it. Let me just check Instagram real quick on my phone. And so Sometimes the only way to get revelation is to have all those distractions removed. Just ask John the Apostle. John received probably the greatest revelation of all, the book of Revelation. And where did he get it? When he was left to die on the island of Patmos. Nothing else to do. Oh good, John. Now you're finally going to slow down enough to hear me about this. So would you write this down? Sometimes the Lord uses isolation to free us from distractions, liberate us from unhealthy dependencies, draw us closer to him, and give us revelation. And give us revelation. If you're in a wilderness place or time in your life, it's likely because God is trying to get your attention. And let me encourage you to give it to him if that's where you're at. I guarantee that there's something he wants to do in you. So Paul tackles the accusations against him by presenting a timeline. He persecuted believers, was saved on the road to Damascus when he encountered the Lord Jesus. Then he goes off to Arabia for three years before returning to Damascus. He's giving his whereabouts during that time and inviting them to check his story with the apostles in Jerusalem. He's making the point that he was a believer and would have been even sharing the gospel with people in Arabia for years before he first met with the apostles in Jerusalem. So he couldn't have heard the gospel from them. He got it from the Lord. He got it from the Lord. Verse 18, then after three years, so after that season in Arabia, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. So Paul makes the journey to Jerusalem finally, but when he gets there, his reputation still strikes such fear into the apostles that only Peter is willing to meet with him. And then Peter talks James into meeting with Paul as well. It's an understandable reaction because they don't know if Paul was legit or if he's an undercover agent playing some sort of long game to try and extinguish Christianity from within by infiltrating it. The idea would be, imagine if it was the 1950s and you were Jewish and Himmler or Goebbels comes into your synagogue. You're probably not going to be satisfied with their explanation of, oh, stop worrying. That was the old Himmler. I'm totally a Jew guy now. It's probably not going to be enough. You're going to be like, well, just to be safe, how about you never ever come here again? That, that, that would be great. This is likely another reason why Jesus had Paul study in Arabia for three years. Had he gone straight to Jerusalem following his conversion, in all likelihood, none of the apostles would have met with him. Dr. Luke writes about this time in the book of Acts. It's on your outlines. He says, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas vouches for Paul. He says, listen, I've seen Paul preach in Damascus. He's for real. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. And so we see an early trend here, as we've pointed out, that would come to define Paul's ministry. Every time he would go into a town, he would always go first to the synagogue because he loved the Jewish people. They were his own people so much that he just longed to see them come to know the Lord. And he'd start preaching. He'd start debating. And they'd eventually have, have no way to counter Paul's logic and arguments because he was a genius of a philosopher and probably the greatest theologian walking the planet at that time. And they would get to the point where they just had no comebacks for Paul. And at that point, their comeback would become, we're going to kill you. And they would run him out of town. And this cycle would go on in most places that Paul would go. So Paul only sticks around Jerusalem for 15 days because he realizes he's getting a bit of a cold shoulder from the people who aren't believers, the Jews there, but also from most of the brethren in the Jerusalem church. They, they still don't believe he's legit. They're not buying into his radical transformation. So Paul says, all right, I guess it's best for me to head out of here. He says in verse 21, afterward I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. They didn't see much of me, but they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. That phrase, they glorified God in me, it just means that they praised God when they heard about what he had done in my life. The point here is that the believers in the region of Judea, which includes the city of Jerusalem, they didn't get to see Paul a whole lot during that time. Paul didn't come down and make really other appearances, but they rejoiced because they were hearing through the grapevine that Paul was now preaching the very same gospel message that he had tried to extinguish through the persecution of the church. In other words, this is the part to understand, the church in Jerusalem affirmed the gospel that Paul was preaching as the true gospel message, the same gospel message that they were preaching and believing in Jerusalem, the one being taught by the apostles. It was the same message. So when Paul says, I received this revelation from the Lord Jesus, his evidence is that he didn't have anywhere else that he could have got it. He wasn't anywhere where he could have heard it really from other people. He didn't meet with the apostles in Jerusalem until years later and the Jerusalem church affirmed when they heard what Paul was preaching, yes, that's the same message that the apostles are preaching. The apostles and Paul were preaching the same gospel, which authenticates the gospel that Paul was preaching as the true gospel. Paul spends the next 11 years in his hometown of Tarsus working from everything we know, just a regular job. He's sharing his testimony in this time. He's preaching the gospel, sharing Jesus with people, ministering as much as he can, but not with the power and effectiveness that we generally associate with his later missionary journeys. Why does Paul stay in Tarsus so long, 11 years? Because at that time, for those years, that's what the Lord was telling him to do. The answer is that simple. That's what the Lord was telling him to do, what the Lord was telling him to do. There were things that the Lord wanted to teach Paul, areas that Paul needed to grow in, Maybe there was just some testosterone that needed to go down a little bit before he'd be ready for what God had planned for him. And here's what I'd love us to realize about those years, those 11 years. They were as important as the years in which Paul was traveling and ministering that we read about in our Bibles. Because if Paul hadn't stayed faithful during those 11 years, if he had become impatient and tried to make it happen himself, or given up because he got tired of waiting, or gotten bitter thinking this is never going to happen, God's not going to use me, he never would have reached those fruitful years. I have a good pastor friend who told me when I was younger that the way effective ministry works is generally not faithful than fruit fruitful. He said it's actually more like faithful, 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 than fruitful. 
And if you know that, if you understand that, and you can say that you know that today you're doing what God wants you to do today, let me assure you that there is nothing better you could be doing with today than that. There's nothing better. If what God has called you to do today is serve your family, work with diligence, fellowship with Him, if that's the assignment for today and you're doing that, that is the single most important thing you could be doing. It would not be better for you to be a missionary in China or Africa if that's not what the Lord has called you to do today. It's all about obedience. And what Paul was being called to do for those 11 years was just work a regular job, learn how to talk to people who don't know Jesus, learn about the questions they have, learn how to talk with a little bit of tact, learn how to grow a little bit in grace. That was the most important thing Paul could be doing in that time. In chapter 6 of this very letter to the Galatians, Paul will, encouraging them by, will encourage them by writing, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I love that verse. I love that verse as a Christian. I love it as a pastor. I love it as a parent. That is another one just to hold on to, just to pray, to confess, and to believe with all your heart. And next week we're going to hear about how God sent someone to find Paul and bring Paul to the place where his ministry would almost overnight become incredibly effective. But it's going to happen after three years of seemingly fruitless ministry in Arabia and 11 years of barely fruitful ministry in Tarsus. That's 14 years of training waiting and growing between the time Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and said, hey, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, and the time that God decided Paul was actually ready to step into that assignment. Fourteen years. And if you read Paul's writings, here's what we know about him. He would have been raring to go from day one, right? That's just Paul. Paul wouldn't have been like, "Well, well, well, can I wait a while? I'm not really a rush into it kind of guy. This was a zealous guy, and as soon as he was a Christian, he's like, I'm going to convert the whole world. And imagine the Lord says, well, that's great, but um, what I need you to do right now is just go get a job and do a good job at your job. And you and I are going to talk, and you're going to grow, and we'll see what happens. I'll tell you when it's time for the next step. What? What? How can that be the plan, Lord? But Paul needed to trust the process. He needed to trust God's timing. He needed to trust that obeying the Lord today, doing what the Lord had given him to do today, was the most important thing that he could possibly be doing. That's the same thing we've got to learn as well. There's nothing more important than the assignment God has given us today. And it's so easy for us to look at that assignment and go, this doesn't seem important enough. This doesn't seem significant enough. It doesn't seem like I'm actually making a difference. We have no idea what the Lord is doing for us. And we also, again, we tend to look with the limited vision of looking at our lives right here. And the Lord may very well be saying, you know what? What I'm doing in you right now, what I'm growing in you, isn't even for here and now. It's for the millennial kingdom, for the ministry assignment you're going to have then. But you've got to learn this now so that you're ready for that then. Would you write this down? If we will focus on daily faithfulness to the Lord, He will produce great fruitfulness over the course of our lives. If we will focus on daily faithfulness to the Lord, He will produce great fruitfulness over the course of our lives. The way the Lord works is not the way we work. We think, let's come up with a spectacular plan. Let's shoot for the moon. Let's set a goal. Let's accomplish something great. And God says, no, 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 no. Just do what I've given you to do today. And I promise when you reach the end of your life and I show you what I've accomplished through you, you're going to be blown away. The Lord works differently than we do. We're going to wrap up and I just want to share a a couple of closing thoughts. This is one of those messages as we often do. We just move through the text and if there's something that the Lord just makes pop out to you, that he says, this is what I want you to know, make sure that you circle it, you underline it, you write it down, you do something with it. And then you go back and revisit that with the Lord. This evening, even tomorrow morning, just say, Lord, is there something more you want to speak to me about this? 
So a few closing thoughts here. Paul was once completely invested in following the minutia of the law. His zeal for Judaism was practically unmatched. And, and all of us know from observing others and ourselves that the more we invest in something that is a lie, the less open we become to considering the truth. Somebody once said, it's far easier to fool someone than to convince someone that they've been fooled. Because the cost would simply be too high. The more we invest in something that is not true, the less likely we are to give it up, even when it's revealed to us to be untrue. Perhaps you know someone like that. They're, they're fully invested in another belief system or the pursuit of happiness or financial or career goals for their life. And they seem unreachable and completely close to the truth because they're so convinced of this other system, this other belief, this other goal in life. And you know what? Right now they might be completely unreachable. They might be completely closed to the truth. But I want to encourage you with this quote from John Stott about Paul back when Paul was the zealous Jew known as Saul. John Stott said this, he said, now a man in that mental and emotional state is in no mood to change his mind or even to have it changed for him by men. Only God could reach him and God did, God did. When a person is closed to the gospel, let me encourage you, keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Don't give up. If they're that person where you say, man, the only person that can reach them is God. If that's true, then he will. He'll do it. Keep praying. Paul's answer to his critics was essentially, I'm an apostle because Jesus revealed himself to me. Jesus personally taught the gospel to me and then proceeded to personally instruct me in the scriptures in Arabia. And then Jesus himself called me to become an apostle, a fact that was affirmed by the other apostles in Jerusalem. So to be an apostle, uppercase A, you had to have seen the resurrected Jesus and you had to have been commissioned, called to ministry by him personally. And Paul had both of these experiences. He encountered the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus and was personally called by the resurrected Jesus to ministry to the Gentiles. But you know what? Here's the truth. Some people will never believe what God says about you. Some people will never believe what God says about you. And Satan loves to discourage us by trying to get us to forget what God says about us. Satan's the one who says, oh, you're, you're too damaged to ever have a meaningful relationship. You'll never get married. Satan's the one who says, your, your marriage is too far gone to ever be something great. Or your kids have seen you mess up so many times, they're never going to follow Jesus. Or you've slipped into sin way too many times for God to ever use you in a significant way. That ship has sailed. Listen, it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. It doesn't matter what Satan says about you. Being a believer is to understand that what the Lord says about you is reality. And I really want us to get this. It's not that what the Lord says about us is his opinion. It's not just that. I'm not here to just encourage you by saying, but I want you to know the Lord thinks you're great. That the Lord thinks you're righteous. That the Lord thinks you're created with greatness. I'm not here to tell you that. I'm, I'm here to tell you that what the Lord says about you is reality. It is the only reality. It is not his opinion. He is speaking to you the truth about who you are. It's not his opinion, it's the truth. And he says that he's causing all things to work together for good for you. He says that he will finish the good work that he started in you. He says that if you believe upon the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. He says that if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, he knows infinitely more how to bless and how to give good gifts to his children. He says that because of Jesus' work on the cross, he remembers your sins no more. He says you're righteous and blameless in Christ Jesus. It does not matter what others say about you. Reality is what the Lord says about you. 
And there are some people who are never going to believe what the Lord says about you. But that doesn't make it untrue. Paul refuted the lies about his calling with the truth, and then he stayed busy living upon the truth. God's got too much that he wants to do in you, too much he wants to do through you, for you to be slowed down by listening to those who refuse to believe what the Lord says about you. There's no time in life for that. There's no time. Those people aren't going where you're going. In his grace, God planned on you being his from the time you were in your mother's womb. He planned to reveal Jesus to you so that Jesus could be revealed in you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then, then you've been called to ministry. As Peter put it, it's on your outlines. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If God has saved you, then, then your life is now about knowing the Lord and about making him known. And we're called to reveal Jesus to our spouses, to our kids, to our grandkids, our co-workers, and everyone else that we come into contact with. We are the only Bible that a lot of people are going to read. We're the only Bible a lot of people are going to read. And so it's our job to tell them and show them what Jesus looks like. And then finally, remember that if the Lord has put this much thought and intent into your life already, if he was planning with such intricacy before you were even born, then you can trust that he has intricately planned a way to see you through to the end. He's going to get you across the finish line. He's going to finish what he started. Believe that. Hold on to that. Hope in that. With that, would you bow your head and close your eyes? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the promises of your word. Thank you for the hope of your word, Lord God. Thank you that what you say about us is not just your opinion. We don't have to just love it because it, it sounds nice and it sounds better than what some of the other things are that are said about us. But what you say about us is the actual truth. It is reality. And so, Father, we just ask once more that you would remove from our thinking anything that has set itself up against the truth of your word. Any belief we might have about ourselves or about anyone else, about our lives, about our future, about what you can do in us and through us. Father, if there's anything in our thinking or deep in our belief system that is untrue, Lord, would you expose it? Would you help us to repent of it and be freed of it? And to instead build our lives on the truth of what you have said about us and about the future you have planned for us. Lord, we, do, we don't even know how to thank you that before we were even born, while we were in our mother's womb, you were already working your plan of grace behind the scenes, intricately, and in ways that we won't know about till we arrive fully in your presence. You were at work making sure that we would be yours, that we would be adopted into your family. Thank you that none of us stumbled into a relationship with you, but you reached out to us, you called us, and you gave us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Father, we thank you in faith for our children and for our grandchildren who we believe you're going to do the same thing for. Lord, we pray for all those that we love and, and that we know who right now are, are unreachable, it seems, Lord. And we thank you in faith that whatever circumstance it's going to take to really reach them, Lord, if there's any way for it to happen, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And so, Father, we just ask you to have your way in every life. And Lord, give us ears to hear what our part might be in any of that. Help us to surrender to you day by day. To not just run around aimlessly trying to be good or earn your favor, but to, Lord, rest 
in the finished work of Jesus and simply ask, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do at work today? Who do you want me to talk to? Help us to live in that place of fellowship, that place of abiding, Lord God. Trusting that as we're simply faithful one day after another, you will bring about great fruitfulness over the course of our lives. Thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us, Jesus.